welcome everyone. It's good to see you all. I was reminded of a, uh, a song um, that I that, uh, used to hear on the radio that it referred to you had to get here early at the Church of Christ to get a seat. And, uh, and that's true for us. So I'm glad you all found a seat with us. If you're visiting with us, there's several here. So thankful that you are here on this Lord's Day with us. And we're thankful for the good group that we have here at Gooch Lane. I hope you never take that for uh, granted that we are blessed indeed by the goodness of God. And speaking of being blessed, thankful, we're glad that Brandon is with us this morning. Uh, he had some medical procedures this week that he has overcome and uh, so great that he, he is going to be able to lead us in our song worship this morning and uh, invite you all to join with him as he leads us now. I do want to say thank you all for your prayers. I certainly appreciate that. My family and I do. I'm very thankful to be here and uh, glad that it's that all it was was the cyst in my pancreas and not not the C word. Did not want to hear that again. So uh, very very thankful for that. Good to see everyone this morning, and we invite everyone to join in our worship to God. We'll start with this song. There is a redeemer. Uh, just a, a note about this song. The uh, soprano and alto sing together, and the bass and tenor sing together during the verses of this song. And then when we get to the chorus, uh, all four parts will sing. We'll also repeat the chorus at the end. If you would like to, please stand while we sing. Please be seated. We'll now go to God in prayer. Bow with me, please. 
Gracious Father, Lord of all creation, we're grateful to have been granted another opportunity to gather to worship and to praise you and to draw closer to you. We ask that you hear our prayers and are glorified in our songs and that you reveal yourself to us more through your word. Lord, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift, so we are thankful for the many blessings that you bestowed on us. Thank you for the life and health that we have today to gather here. We thank you also for the love that is shared within your family and the encouragement and support that we have through each other so that we can know that we're never standing alone. We also thank you for those who lead and guide us, the elders here, those that preach and the teachers here. Please bless them with your wisdom and the skill to guide us in your ways. And Lord, today we're thankful for the many, mother, the many mothers that are ever hard at work caring for and raising the children, not only to be good, but God-fearing and daily instilling love for you in their young hearts. I ask that you bless every mother and let them know the love and immense value that they are to us and to your kingdom. And most of all, thank you for your son Jesus in whom was performed the ultimate act of love that he was willing to give himself in innocence for us who were guilty and hateful. May we always live in humility and gratitude, seeking your will in all things. All this we ask in his name. Amen. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing, He Carried My Sorrows. We'll sing all four stanzas. This time has been set aside for us to observe the Lord's Supper. 
Is there anyone that needs the emblems in the audience? Before we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like to read from Psalm chapter 22. Psalm chapter 22. In verse 1, it starts out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. and you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. And there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This psalm starts out with the question, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Of course, the only time we see this anywhere else in the Bible is when Jesus is on the cross. And we understand that this psalm is messianic in nature. Many of the things spoken were experienced by Jesus on the cross, and we see that the psalmist feels utterly hopeless. He feels that God has forsaken him. He feels a strong sense of separation from God due to his situation. He understands that God is holy and that he has delivered the fathers, that they have trusted in him and were not ashamed. But at the same time, he characterizes himself as a worm. It's because in this situation, he's treated as less than a person. He's mocked, although he's righteous. He's persecuted. And much more so, his faith in God is mocked. He says, he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. And we read in the Old Testament where Bashan was a place with good produce and well-fortified cities. And so being surrounded by the bulls of Bashan would reference a, you know, strong and well-supplied adversaries. And as Jesus hung on the cross, he's utterly exhausted and helpless, surrounded by evil. They pierced him. It says he can count all his bones, perhaps because he can see them through his skin, or perhaps referencing the fact that not a bone of his, um, of his was broken. But he's completely humiliated and exposed. They cast lots for his clothing as he is hanging, hanging without them on the cross. And I'd like to continue reading through the rest of the psalm here. It says, But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried out to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for your kingdom belongs to the Lord. For kingdom, excuse me, kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. 
All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. I just want to note a couple phrases that stick out to me in these verses. One, that he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. That the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All those who could not keep themselves alive shall bow before him, and his righteousness will be proclaimed to a people yet unborn. You know, as David wrote these words thousands of years ago, he would have realized that despite his terrible and hopeless situation, that God had the power to save. And as we read this nearly 3,000 years later, we understand that God not only has the power to save physically, but spiritually as well. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, and we know that he was resurrected again on the third day and later ascended to be with God the Father for all eternity. And all families and nations are able to be saved and worship before God because of his sacrifice. We could not keep ourselves alive because of sin, but because of God, he has saved us through Christ's sacrifice, and we can be restored and bow before him. And certainly as we eat of the emblems this morning, the bread and the fruit of the vine, we not only remember his body that was broken and his blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins, but as Paul tells us, we also proclaim his death to others until he comes again. Let's remember that wonderful sacrifice as we partake of the emblems this morning. Would you please pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Father, for the time that we can share together this morning that we can come together and remember your son's death. Father, who are we that you should send your son to die for us, but a, a sinful people who at some point in our lives have turned our backs on you? Father, you have been merciful and kind to us to send your son as a sacrifice for our sins that he might bear our punishment on the cross. We thank you for his willingness to go forward with that. And we thank you, Father, for his body, which was bruised and beaten and broken on our behalf, that we might be reconciled to you. Please be with us this morning as we partake, that we might do so in a manner that's well-pleasing in your sight. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. Please pray with me again. Our Father in heaven, as we continue to remember your son's sacrifice, we're mindful of his blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. We understand, Father, that he, he knew what he must do on our behalf and that he could have called thousands of angels to come and rescue him from the cross. But instead, because of your love for us, because of his obedience to your will, he allowed himself to be offered as a sacrifice on our behalf. We are so very thankful, Father, 
that we are able to be redeemed through his shed blood. Pray, Father, that we can remember him as we partake this morning. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper this morning. Just as a way of reminder, on the first day of the week, we're also commanded to lay by in store, and there's receptacles in the back where we can place uh, those contributions. I'd also like to offer a prayer uh, for all the blessings that the Lord has bestowed upon us and, and offer thanks for those things, if you would pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we know that you promised us that if we would seek first your kingdom and its righteousness, you would take care of all of our physical needs. We recognize, Father, that you do, that you do that, and that you allow us to fully place our trust in you uh, to take care of all those things. And as we live in this earth, we recognize that we have many physical blessings, far more than what we need. And Father, we thank you for that. We realize that all things come from you. As we give back just a small portion of those things this morning, pray, Father, that we can do so with happy and joyful hearts, trusting in your ability to provide. And pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. The title of the chapter in my Bible is Zion's Coming Salvation. Verse 1. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. 
but you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink your wine for which you have labored. For those who garner it shall eat it and praise the Lord, and those who gather it shall drink it in the courts of my sanctuary. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones, lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called salt out, a city not forsaken. We'll sing two more songs before Greg's lesson, both of which go along with his topic this morning. The first will be God will take care of you. Sing all four stanzas. No
Now we'll sing The Rock That Is Higher Than I. We'll sing all three stanzas of this song. If you would like to, please stand while we sing. you'd like, you can be making your way over to Psalm 124. Psalm 124, we're going to start there in just a minute. I always feel like days like today are kind of a church exchange program. Uh, I notice several of our people are away, I'm sure, visiting their mamas, and uh, we have a lot of people here with us visiting their mamas, and we're sure glad that you're here today. Uh, thank you to those mothers out there who do such a good job and have done such a good job uh, with your children. You do not get a lot of recognition many times, but uh, certainly I can speak for myself that what you do doesn't go unnoticed, and I appreciate that. In fact, it might be mothers that would appreciate my first question today, and that is, when was the last time you felt overwhelmed? You might say, well, that was about two hours ago. <laughs> I know that Lionel Richie never got kids ready for church when he's saying it's easy like Sunday morning. <laughs> it's one of the hardest times. And uh, mothers understand that, fathers understand that. Really though, what I ask is, when was the last time you really felt a sustained feeling of being overwhelmed? Maybe it was a job, maybe it was financial troubles, maybe it was sickness, maybe it was raising kids. But that word overwhelmed literally back in its beginning signified a time that would typify being totally submerged under water. And we'll still use that sometimes. We, we sometimes say, well, I'm just drowning in work this week. And the idea there is that you got so much going on. The reason I ask that question is it has something to do with the series that we've been looking at the past few weeks on holy conduct. I'll share with you, I always have a bit of trepidation of preaching a series of lessons like this. Because many times what happens is people who are doing just a, a stellar job in serving the Lord and, and seeking to do what's right, 
will hear these and begin thinking about all of their shortcomings and think, I'm just not doing enough, I'm, I'm messing up, I'm, I'm not doing uh, all of these things I need to. And so I always am a little concerned that maybe those that should be targeted or not, and those who really don't need to be targeted are. But yet I think for all of us, what we understand is that when we look at something like this, where we're talking about day-to-day living, practical things that we're dealing with on a very regular basis, that sometimes it is easy to feel overwhelmed and to, to begin thinking about all of our mistakes, all of our failures, and we're thinking back maybe over the weeks and years of, of our lives in Christ, and we're just thinking all these times when we could have done better and we didn't. And we feel overwhelmed. And so this morning, as we bring this series to its conclusion, I want to share some thoughts with you that I believe will be helpful in that. That when we begin looking at at what really is a challenging thing to live a holy life, to let it regulate what we say and what we do and how we feel about others and how we treat others, that there is encouragement for us. And that God has not been short in giving us that encouragement. So this morning as we think about living lives of holy conduct, I want us to consider how we can keep our motivation in that. And one of those ways is what we just sang about. And that is, God is on our side. Uh, Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied. God will take care of you. Sometimes the shadows do feel deep and rough seems the path to our goal. But we can fly to that rock because God has made the promise to us that He is with us. And I thought to introduce this idea this morning, we would just go to a psalm that typifies that idea. This is a psalm that was written by David. We don't know exactly when it was. But I want you to note the the stellar idea that David begins with as he thinks about God being his help. He says, if God had not been on our side. And then I want you to notice he doesn't finish that phrase. He doesn't stop it. He says, if God had not been on our side or the Lord who was on our side... Pause, ask the crowd to join in. Now, let's let Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. Isn't that interesting? That as David begins this, he says, no, we need to stop and we need to have the whole congregation join in and we'll repeat this, that these are the things that would have happened if God was not with us. But what I want you to note is, is that David was unafraid to make that claim. Sometimes when we talk about this, we want to put ifs or if I'm doing the right thing or whatever. Here's David, a man who surely understood what it meant to fail sometimes in holy conduct. But at this point in his life, he could say, God is on my side. The Lord is with me. Let's notice here specifically as he's talking about what was likely a battle that they had just won that maybe uh, to look at it would have been in doubt concerning the victory. He says, if the Lord had not been on our side when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive. He says, let's think about this, that what we've just come out of, if God had not been with us, then our enemy would have swallowed us alive. Now, that is some strong Old Testament language going on. Oftentimes, we're reading about the enemy swallowing or some event swallowing up. Here, though, when he associates that with being swallowed alive, we're coming to a phrase that oftentimes is going to indicate going down to the grave, going down to Sheol. Let me show you a couple of examples of that. You remember when Korah and his company rebelled against Moses, against the Lord really, in the wilderness? In Numbers chapter 16, verse 30, this is what Moses says. 
If the Lord creates something new and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into Sheol, then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. And that's exactly what happened. These men had rebelled. God opens the earth up and quite literally they fall down into the pit or the grave or into Sheol. As the father in Proverbs 1 is warning his sons about the wrong kinds of companions, he describes them like this. They're going to say something like, let Sheol, like Sheol, uh, let us swallow them alive and whole like those who go down to the pit. Both of these instances, what we're seeing is, is something of a disaster is taking place. And as David thinks about his relationship with the Lord and the nation's relationship, he says, that's what would have happened to us if God had not been on our side. But he continues on. And he says, not only would that have happened, but look at verse 4, then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters, threefold A description here. If God hadn't been with us, we would have been swept away by the flood, the torrent, the waters. Sure disaster would have been there. But yet, what does he then say? He says, blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Since God was on their side, He says, we did not go down to the grave. Our enemy did not swallow us up. We weren't prey for them. Notice what he says next. Verse 7. We have escaped like a bird when the snare of the fowlers, the snare is broken and we have escaped. He says, with God on our side, there is no trap that's going to be able to keep us. So here we've got... Let all the congregation say, if the Lord was not on our side, we would have been swallowed alive. We would have been washed away by the floods. But since the Lord is on our side, the enemy did not swallow us. We have been broken free of that trap. And then as he concludes the psalm, he goes back to that earlier idea about the Lord. And he says, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. At this moment in time in David's life, he understood what it meant to have God on your side. And God, by preserving this short poem for us, is saying we can have that same kind of confidence. That like Israel, like David, there are going to be times in our lives when the enemy is going to try to discourage us. The enemy is going to try to make us think that the ways of God are too hard. Yet listen to Psalm 46, this time from the sons of Korah. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, that's a passage on being overwhelmed. Here's the water that's covering everything, including the mountains, and the psalmist is saying, we have nothing to be concerned about because God is our refuge. The rock that is higher than I is the refuge. But yet here's what the enemy is going to seek to get us to think that all of these commands for holy conduct are well beyond our ability. That no matter how hard we try, we're going to fail. We're not only going to fail, we're going to fail many times over, fail many times over miserably. And what that is, is the drip of doubt that he's feeding us until finally we'll say, I just can't do it. And that's a true statement if God is not on our side. But the point that God makes to us throughout the scriptures is that when we are trying to serve Him, He is going to be there, He is going to help us, and He's not going to abandon us. Yeah, there are going to be times that it's difficult. There are going to be pressing times, and there's going to be times when we likely will fail. But God is saying, I will not give up on you. 
When we consider that idea from Hebrews chapter 4, which I think is perhaps one of the most encouraging passages in the New Testament. Verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now listen to where that leads. The writer says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The writer says to us that if we will trust God, here's what we can have confidence in, that when our time of need is there, He's there. He understands. Jesus lived on the earth. He faced the temptations we face. He Himself was tested in living holy conduct. And the writer says His help is there in that time of need. And when that time comes, there is grace and there is forgiveness even when we fail. Are there going to be times that we go through very rough patches in our life? The answer to that is yes. And there are going to be times when we are vexed with temptation. And what God says is the way you can get through this is if you trust me to help. But he also says if you fail, don't give up. Don't quit. Because I forgive. Now, we never want to approach that from the standpoint of saying, I can sin because I know God forgives. That's not it. But it's the understanding that God knows. That God felt what I'm feeling. And that when I fail to live like Jesus, He's not going to abandon me. God is for us. God is on our side. And what we are doing every day is that we are praying confident prayers that God will be there to help us when those times of struggling come. If we can remember that, if we can remember that we are not in this thing on our own, that's going to give us the encouragement to keep on. It's going to give us the motivation to live day by day by day in the way that God desires, building us to what we're going to see next. And that being that he said, you can be enthusiastic for what's to come. All of this is not some heavenly game where God's seeing what he can make us do. That's not it. God is saying, what I'm doing is preparing you. We talked about Jesus can sympathize with us. Let's explore that a little bit more. The gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, reveal to us how one who is perfect conducts himself in holy ways. Luke perhaps sums this up the best in the book of Acts. As he's just giving us a general overview of Jesus, he says he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, and God was with them. Now there's there's the idea of holy conduct in a nutshell. Remember, God's with you, and because of that, you can go around doing good, and in doing good, you can defeat the enemy. That's exactly what Jesus did. And so here was one who faced those day-to-day struggles and he not only taught how to conduct oneself in a holy way, he modeled it. And isn't that, by the way, what separates the average teacher from the good teacher? The good teacher believes what he or she is teaching. It's not something that you're doing for any other reason other than this is the right thing to do and I want to help other people to do it. We know that from school, don't we? How are you going to learn those algebra problems? Most people, it's going to be the teacher demonstrating, right? Teacher knows his or her stuff, writing that out on the board. And you know, to take that a step further, even when you think about someone in that position in their daily life, They're going to live in such a way so that if they run into one of those kids 
who they're teaching every day, there's not going to be a conflict there. That teacher is going to model not only what he or she is teaching, but also what it means to be a good citizen, a good person. It's what Jesus did. But really more to our point today, we see that Jesus modeled the idea of enthusiastic for what's to come. As Jesus walked the earth, those years of his ministry, putting up with the, the religious elite that's trying to come after him, teaching the right thing, helping the apostles, he understood that all of that was for a purpose, all of that was for a reason. In fact, John chapter 17 Verses 4 and 5, as he's praying this final, at least lengthy prayer before his crucifixion, he says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So there's the holy conduct. There's what he did. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, there was a danger. If Jesus had failed in that mission. But because he did not fail, he could say, I have done everything with this purpose in mind, and that is to share in your glory. And I would suggest to you that that is the exact same thing you and I are looking for. Last Sunday night, we spent some time thinking about eternal life from the the writings of John. And that's what John is emphasizing to us more than anything else is that what we're doing here is getting us ready to enter into that eternal union with God that we know some about here, but we'll know all about eternally. And so as we consider those things, Jesus had a purpose. As Jesus lived a life of holy conduct, what could get him up in the morning, what could get him going, what could help him do the right thing, is he was thinking about where that was leading. And when we have that idea, we can as well. So what about when we consider what we can become? What does that mean for us? The first thing we need to understand is, is it's really built into us. What the Apostle Paul taught us is that God created us for a purpose. We find this over in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, beginning down in verse 8. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Sometimes, as humans, we'll get into our philosophizing and we'll say, why am I even here? What's our purpose on the face of the earth? Well, here it is. God says, I have created you for good works, But not just any good works, it's works that are going to be done in Jesus Christ, in your relationship to me. And so then, when I consider that, each of these conduct commands is working toward that purpose. I might say, well, why would God tell me to do this? Why would God tell me to do that? Why does he want me to live in this way? What difference does it make if I, and you can finish those out. And what God is saying is, all of this is working toward that eternal purpose for which I created you, that you can do these good things in Jesus Christ, and by living a life of holy conduct, you're going to be like him. You're going to be like my son. So then, What we understand is is that God has created us for a reason. And God's purpose in our creation should create enthusiasm. Why can I be excited? Why can I be motivated? I'm thinking about what's on down the road. I'm thinking about where all of this is going to lead. I thought Romans 15 might be a good passage for us to think about just a minute this morning. Paul's writing here 
He says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing of your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol Him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. And may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. There's three reasons I chose this passage. One is we're Gentiles. And so we we better appreciate what's going on here. Second thing is, we see the entire Godhead on our side. This is one of those Trinity passages, isn't it? Where the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all working together for us. So that's our first point. God's on our side, Father, Son, and Spirit. Here's our second point about the enthusiasm we can have over what we're going to become. This God of hope is doing what? He's filling us with joy and peace right now. If I'm submitting to God, if I'm trusting in Him, if I believe He has a purpose for me, He's filling me with joy and peace so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound. And if we can go back to the first part of our sermon and change this up a bit, that you may be overwhelmed in hope. See, the overwhelming here is not bad. The overflow is not bad. What it means is is we are being constantly inundated with the joy and the peace that God provides. So what that then means is when I'm thinking about my enthusiasm toward, toward being with God and being what He wants me to become, That hope means that I have a confident expectation. When the devil's after me to quit, to stop, to give up, this hope should overwhelm me. And when that takes place, it also means that I can understand that this is how God is recreating me for things to come. Whatever he's seeing in my purpose, he's saying that by giving you these commands, they are molding you into what I want you to be eternally. But here's the thing. I have got to trust that God knows best. That's the crux. If I'm constantly approaching his commands with, why would God do this? Why would God do that? Why would God tell me this? I won't know that hope. And I for sure won't know that joy and peace. So it's the faith that whatever he sees that I need to change is for my eternal good. So the next time you're feeling discouraged, read some of John's thoughts on eternity. Read the book of Ephesians where God is talking about this eternal craftsmanship that He's shown in us. And let that enthusiasm overtake you. Let's look at a final point here. So God's on our side. We're excited, enthusiastic for what we will become. The third thing that I think helps us in this is that it's going to help others to find salvation. The Apostle Peter is going to make that point very strongly. And we've been working off of his command all along in this series. Because what he's going to do is use that word conduct throughout both of his epistles. Six times we're going to find it. Sometimes our English translations disguise that because they'll use a synonym. But six times this word conduct appears. This is the one we've been following. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. We find as well... In verse 18, just a short ways down from this, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal conduct inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold. And then one more along this line, in 2 Peter this time, as he's kind of wrapping all things up and talking about eternity, 
He says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holy conduct? And what do all three of those share in common? It's, it's a self-inspection. It's saying, I'm trying to be holy as God is holy. I'm putting away the futile conduct that would make me unholy. I'm looking toward the end, and I'm living my life in holy conduct in view of that. So that's three of them. But the other three times that he uses conduct, he he changes the camera angle just a bit on it, and he says, the conduct that you're displaying here, It's not only going to impact you, it's going to impact others also. And so he says this in chapter 2, verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good conduct and glorify God on the day of visitation. Is that interesting? He says all these people who are against God, let them see what it looks like to live a godly life. You think about in your workplace, on the ball field, wherever you are, wherever you spend time, and there might be that temptation to stray from the path of holy conduct. Here's a good motivation. When you think about the way that I respond to the boss, the way I respond to the coach, the way I respond to my peers here, who who are not behaving in the right way. In short term, it may be hard. But in the long term, my conduct may help them to glorify God on the day of visitation. We think about what Peter told wives who are married to unbelieving husbands. He says, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, Peter says, don't nag them about becoming a Christian. Don't spend every day saying, why aren't you a Christian? Why don't you go to church with me today? He says, don't do that. He says, let them see what a Christian lives like. Let them see what a Christian looks like. He says, that may very well bring that unbelieving husband to God. And then in 3.16, he says, having a good conscience so that if you are slandered, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. If it doesn't bring them to the Lord, at least they're going to realize that they are hurting a good person. So, that's awfully good motivation. That when I think about how I conduct myself amongst others, that the words I speak, backed up by action, may have an impact. Now, there's a point I want us to understand. These actions are not going to convert. Someone can't just look at me and say, oh, well, now I need to be a Christian. It's the message of Jesus Christ that converts, and that alone. But what my conduct may do is testify that I really do believe what I say. That people who know I'm a Christian, people who know my relationship with the Lord are going to look at me and my words and they are going to find no daylight in between them. What I preach is what I practice. So then, if I profess brotherly love, where we started this series... I'm not going to talk too much about others. I'm not running people down. I'm not gossiping about them. No, my holy conduct is saying, I'm going to keep my words only to that which is going to encourage and perhaps bring someone to better understand the need to follow the Lord. If I profess respect for others, I'm not going to lust after a woman in my heart as we talked about in one of those lessons. I am not going to objectify her and against her will take advantage and turn that around. Lady's not going to do that to a man. No, we're going to totally respect. But I'm also not going to put a stumbling block there. 
I'm not going to wear the kind of clothing that may set someone off. Now, as we talked about, my thoughts are my responsibility. But yet the Lord has also said, if you willingly cause someone to stumble, there's going to be an answer for that. And so I'm not going to be just terribly concerned about stylishness or fitting in or anything like that because my words are going to match my actions. If I really respect someone else, I'm going to do nothing to put them in that bad situation. If I profess respect for authority, then I'm not only going to follow God's ways, I'm going to appreciate them. And when I see these commands, I don't roll my eyes at them. I don't think about how tough life is. I simply say, God is working me for an eternal purpose. And whatever he's seeing that I need to do to change here, I'm going to trust him in that. I appreciate what he's told me to do. And if I profess to work well with others, by no means am I going to discourage them. I'm not going to act haughty. I'm not going to to do something to make them feel inferior. I'm not going to ignore them. I'm not going to stop talking to them because I'm mad about something. I'm not going to do any of these things because my words and my conduct are one and the same. And so if I can do all of this, my actions are going to demonstrate my genuineness. I'm going to borrow a verse from Peter that really he's using to make another point, but we're not going to damage it by using that point here. In chapter 1, verse 7, he says that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, if I live a life of holy conduct, I'm showing myself to be a genuine believer that what God has told me is right and what He's prepared for me is worth it and that He will not abandon me at any step of the way. So I hope all of us are committed to this holy life And the conduct that we've discussed in these lessons and others that that maybe we'll look at before the year's over, that all of these things we can understand that we can do by the grace of God. Because God is seeking to make us people who are fit to be in His household. Thank you so much this morning for your good attention. If you're not a Christian, I want you to think about the promise that God is with you. That song we sang earlier expresses it so well. Life's not going to be easy. But to know that you have an eternal friend who is on your side can get you through any rough spots. And to think about what he is seeking to do with you. I don't know what all is going to be involved in the grand eternal adventure that awaits us on the other side. But from the words that God has shared with us, I am confident we will not be disappointed. And whatever God is preparing us to do here is going to be even greater in that time to come. I would hate for any of us to miss that out of stubbornness or fear. I would hate for any of us to miss it because we've allowed the enemy to plant seeds of doubt about the goodness of God as he did with Eve and Adam. I would love it on this Mother's Day as if everyone committed themselves to our Father who is in heaven. And so if you're outside of Jesus Christ this morning, I hope you'll give that some serious thought. It is a challenge to live a godly life, but it's not an impossibility. It is a challenge for every day to think about pleasing God. But it's doable because He's with us. And I hope that this morning you'll make that decision. That you're ready to walk with Him and to let Him make you into what you need to be. If you need to respond to His invitation this morning, you can come while we stand and sing.
we have just a few brief announcements to share with you, and then we will be uh, dismissed. love to 